Amina Mohammed from the United Nations, uh, who's in charge of the Sustainable Development Group. May I request my team to play the video message, please? Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we live in an era defined by two factors. The first is the growing frequency and intensity of our global shocks. From wars and conflicts to the climate crisis, global events have wrought tragedy and loss for millions of people. Second, we have witnessed the limits of our multilateral system. Global cooperation is the best and only effective defense against global shocks. Yet our institutions and our modes of cooperation are outdated and ill-equipped to meet today's challenges. These two factors contribute to the disappointing progress being made towards our sustainable development goals. Last year's progress report found that only 15% of the targets were on track. Indeed, our system of international development cooperation has struggled to rise to the challenge, and global solidarity has been missing in action. Excellencies, we need to recapture the spirit of solidarity that defined the negotiation of the SDGs. Today, the goals remain as relevant as ever. They provide an overarching roadmap for achieving sustainable development and overcoming the multiple crises confronting the world. We need the SDGs to succeed. And governments agree. At the SDG summit in September last year, member states reiterated their commitment to the 2030 agenda. The summit declaration acknowledged that multilateralism remains fundamental to bridging geopolitical divides and addressing today's challenges of conflicts, climate emergency, poverty, inequality, and hunger. So now is the time to move from words to action. We need a dramatic acceleration to deliver on the promise of the SDGs in these extremely challenging times. This includes recognizing that the existing international financial system is certainly not fit for purpose. It remains plagued with systemic and historic inequities that shape foreign assistance. We came out of the summit with a strong signal that the financing framework needs to be updated and reformed. Governments cannot act independently. We must work to strengthen partnerships between the public and private sector to channel greater volumes of finance towards key transitions and to harness the power of science, technology and innovation to bridge data gaps and strengthen SDG localization. Moreover, we must urgently reinvigorate multilateralism to address today's challenges and maximize opportunities and to increase the participation of the Global South across all of the structures that support the multilateral system. Excellencies, I'd like to commend India for its 2023 presidency of the G20 and leading the way for the G20 Action Plan to accelerate progress on the SDGs. And the Delhi Declaration, which signified a strong commitment from G20 leaders to advancing women's rights on a global scale by committing to closing gender gaps, promoting women's participation in the economy, and investing in social protection and the care society. The Summit of the Future in September provides us yet another opportunity to gather the world around the need to accelerate progress towards the 2030 Agenda for everyone everywhere. In the lead-up to the summit, some of the major proposals set out in the Secretary-General's Our Common Agenda report will be taken up, including the new Agenda for Peace, reform of the global financial architecture, our responsibilities to future generations, and the Global Digital Compact. This wide-reaching agenda can restore trust, equity, and fairness at the center of our global cooperation. I encourage you all to engage in these processes. We need voices across the public and private sectors to demand change and to promote development cooperation that is more agile, inclusive, and effective in addressing the complex challenges of our times. Let's work together to achieve the SDGs and shape a more peaceful, a better, and a prosperous future where no one is left behind. Thank you. Uh, we are also going to uh, use the occasion of uh, this panel discussion, the next one, Development Deficit Towards the Post-2030 Agenda, uh, to release a publication uh, we have produced uh, on uh, promoting circularity in the value chain of plastics in India. And uh, can I request my colleagues to flash the report cover? Please pick this up. We've done it with uh, Bisleri, which is one of India's uh, uh, premier 
uh, mineral water company, and this is something that we want to promote in the coming days. We've taken out a report that uh, all of you should pick up on the way out. So it's available on the stands now, as it were. And with that, let me now invite uh, the speakers uh, for this afternoon session on development deficit, uh, Minister Dungyal, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs and External Trade, Bhutan, Minister Narayan Prakash Saud, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Nepal, uh, Tanya Jovic, advisor to the President of Serbia, Angelo George, Chief Executive Officer, Bisleri India, Isabel Shan, represent, resident representative of UNDP India, and it will be moderated by Jacqueline Lamb, Regional Director, Sustainable Energy for All from Singapore. So please join me in welcoming the panelists on the stage. Thank you. Jacqueline, you get the first seat. And you are now in charge. Make sure that the speakers have the mic close to their face as they speak, because we have an online audience that requires good audio for them to join and participate in. So you have now 50 minutes. Thank you very much, Dr. Saran, and good afternoon to everyone. Um, it's really an honor to sit alongside an esteemed panel such as this one. Um, now, I'll, I'll go directly into the topic because I know 15 minutes to get into the trenches with such an important discussion um, is, is really not sufficient time. So in the post-2030 development agenda, while um, the global community has been working towards more inclusivity, more equity, um, we've fallen short of uh, some of the development goals. From 2015, we've been guided by the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and there have been good progress in some areas. Uh, for example, um, we've, we've together, uh, alongside the presidency of um, India for G20 and COP28 last year, there have been uh, strong pledges towards tripling renewable energy deployment, as well as doubling energy efficiency. Um, in that context, my organization, Sustainable Energy for All, was set up to deliver um, sustainable development goal number seven for affordable and clean energy for everyone um, in support of SDG 13 for climate action as well. So on that note, um, you know, there's been a, a wide range of work that ne has needed to be done, uh, and we've seen how um, a myriad of actors and stakeholders are required to ensure progress. So on that note, I want to invite um, Minister Saud to uh, tell us more about his perspective on the goals, um, the objectives and timelines that you envisage for the post-2030 development agenda, especially in the context of Nepal. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Madam Jacqueline. Uh, now we are in the crisis of time, uh, in the crucial uh, moment in the history. Uh, there are multiple crises around the world. Uh, the impact of pandemics, Ukraine war, Palestine conflict, along with climate emergencies, are all challenges to humanity and uh, to meet the 2030 development goal also. So it is very uh, difficult, challenging uh, to meet the goal. So we should also uh, have preparation for uh, development deficit uh, towards a post-2030 agenda. So, uh, we should have south-to-south uh, -south cooperation, north-to-south cooperation, and the financial institution which are helping us, they should uh, work for the, to meet the target. Before this, we also have a Millennium Challenge goal, uh, but uh, it was very difficult to meet uh, for the developing country, least developing country. Being a least developing country, we have uh, too many constraints to explain the limited resources. Uh, so it is very uh, challenging for developing countries uh, to meet those challenges. So international community institutions, uh, 
they should modify the processes, uh, they should uh, make uh, proper type of uh, cooperation mechanism, uh, and they should also provide uh, the finance sources for financial uh, development also. Uh, if we can't meet the especially listed developed countries can't meet the goal, uh, international effort should be uh, done uh, to assist those countries uh, which, are, which are behind the process. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. And picking up on the point of South-South cooperation, I'd like to invite Minister dung -Yel as well to share your perspective, especially in the context of Bhutan. Uh, thank you, Jacqueline. And uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I must thank the organizers for giving us this opportunity, and uh, especially for Bhutan. Uh, to get this opportunity is uh, quite big. And uh, in fact, uh, we had been, of course, attending these programs before also. But for me, Dian Dungel, this is the first time, so I'm re really pleased and I would like to thank the organizers for giving, me, uh, giving us this opportunity. Now, coming to the South-South cooperation, yes, North-South cooperation is very important. There is already a marked difference between North-South cooperation and South-South cooperation in the society. As I feel, in the perspective of Bhutan, if I, if I speak, South-South cooperation deals in countries which are of same geographical nature, economic com competence, and uh, I think we are almost in the same, same platform only. Now, unless we cooperate among ourselves and share our experiences, our expertise, and uh, take out solutions that, that suits our necessity, maybe Dealing with North-South cooperation only may not be feasible. It, it almost, uh, 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 it almost seems that, you know, we will be depending much more on the North-South cooperation, uh, on the North than the South-South one. Therefore, for Bhutan to cooperate with South-South uh, cooperative countries, you know, those, 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 those countries which are here within the South-South cooperation, uh, Bhutan definitely feels comfortable because we are almost on the same, same platform and maybe we'll be able to uh, collaborate and uh, gain experience in a much better way. I think I leave it at this only for the subsequent questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister Dung Yao. And Ms. Tatiana, I think Serbia is very well placed to look at both the north-south cooperation being on the uh, uh, border of, of the EU, as well as the south-south cooperation being um, you know, part of the global community in, in development as well. So we'd like to invite you um, to talk a little bit more about your perspective on South-South, as well as bringing in some of the North-South cooperation opportunities that can be leveraged to accelerate South-South cooperation. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to address uh, this, uh, at this great event on behalf of the President and the Government of the Republic of Serbia. Uh, if I may say, one world has to be uh, imperative for all of us uh, to achieve different goals. In today's world, it's solidarity and uh, no distance should be uh, excused for uh, not having a cooperation among us all. That's why the uh, Republic of Serbia initiated uh, many regional initiatives uh, and it became obvious in uh, times of crisis like it was COVID uh, how useful it is and uh, uh, how good is that for all the region, but even beyond the uh, borders of our region. Uh, as we are running short on time to achieve all the goals of uh, the 2030 agenda, we need uh, to find uh, um, uh, new sources of growth, uh, new ways uh, to, to achieve that and to think uh, what to do after uh, 
2030. Uh, so, as a result of that, our future activities are focused on innovation, uh, research, development, and crea creative industries. Uh, I would like to emphasize that the Republic of Serbia is the first country in the region of the Southeast Europe that joined the Global Partnership on Artificial Intelligence and adopted the development strategy in this area even back in 2019. So BU4 campus is being built uh, as a unique uh, multidisciplinary complex for research and development and we really invite all uh, to uh, participate in that project and uh, you are all very welcome. Um, one opportunity to do so will be also the specialized uh, um, International Exhibition Expo 2027 in Belgrade, uh, where the Republic of Serbia will place special emphasis on the participation and representation of developing and least developed countries. Uh, we firmly believe that knowledge and science uh, have one of the key roles to play in uh, speeding up the pace of activities uh, towards the impl implementation of the 2030 Agenda. And uh, therefore, we are really very proud uh, at the proposal of the Republic of Serbia and Group of States that the United uh, Nations General Assembly adopted a resolution proclaiming the period from 2024 to 2033 as the International Decade of Science and Sustainable Development. So these uh, new ways are very important uh, IT, digitalization are very important in today's world to achieve uh, uh, our joint goals. Thank you very much, Ms. Tatiana. And over to Isabel for the UNDP perspective. Um, there, there's been a lot of uh, country-specific and region-specific types of collaboration that we've been seeing. From the UNDP perspective, can you share a little bit more about the regional cooperation perspectives on the post-2030 agenda and how we can potentially bring in multi-stakeholder approaches to facilitate this? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks to, to the organizers for inviting, can you hear me? For inviting uh, UNDP. Um, well, let's first, if I may, take stock, I think uh, several uh, excellencies have mentioned, we are not there where we wanted to be with the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, as of uh, 2023, only 12% of the SDG targets are on track and uh, progress, um, 30%, progress on 30% is stalled or has even gone into reverse. And uh, more dramatically, uh, if I can say so, the SDG financing gap has actually widened and has obviously widened a lot uh, through the pandemic. And it stands now at 3.9 trillion US dollars. And um, well, as this financing gap is increasing, the resources available for SDG financing are decreasing. So we definitely have a huge challenge in front of us for the next six years to achieve these ambitious goals. Now, um, if we look ahead, I mean, we have already now, I think, we, if we talk about uh, regional cooperation or south-south cooperation, east-east cooperation, north-south cooperation, south-north cooperation, we cannot achieve the SDGs without this uh, cooperation. I think the world is so much interlinked uh, that without this um, cross-border, regional, cross-regional, global collaboration, we will not be able to uh, achieve it. Um, and I think we will, I mean, there's obviously several platforms existing at the national level, at the regional level, but also at the uh, uh, in a country like India, in a huge country, a subcontinent with several states at the state level. But maybe uh, let's look at where we want to go after, uh, after 2030. Well, we have heard it, the, the world is, is quite complex and uh, I dare to say since the Sustainable Development Goals were designed and agreed upon, the world became even more complex. Um, so, um, we are 
the underlying objectives for the Sustainable Development Goals will certainly also still hold true in 2030. Um, so even like countries like Finland um, is yet still far away, there's 86% of the SDG targets, so, um, and even Finland would need all this collaboration. I think that is just one country I picked, but I could have picked other countries as well. Still, I think we can say, and with the MDGs were mentioned, the world made a big step forward from the F, uh, MDGs to the SDGs. And uh, I think we are lucky to have this, sustain, this very ambitious sustainable development goals. Now, in terms of implementation, uh, and I think uh, the advisor to the President of Serbia said it, uh, we also need to look at the new tools we have. And uh, these tools are certainly, digitalization is certainly a very important uh, tool we have. And uh, being in India, uh, I think we are very well placed to mention and to see how digitalization is an accelerator and a very strong accelerator uh, towards the achievement of SDGs. And uh, these experiences in India, but that could also be from elsewhere, they are very important uh, and they can be used also and transposed, obviously it needs to be contextualized in South-South cooperation. Only some months ago, I was not based in India, but I was based in West Africa, in Burkina Faso, and I have seen the South-South cooperation between India and Burkina Faso, and UNDP was implementing, was helping that, and I, I really, uh, the impact that made, and this was on a, on a water resource management, but the impact it made for the livelihoods and the peace building of the communities was quite impressive. Um, now, one point uh, I would mention before I conclude on this is the question of leaving no one behind. As you all know, leaving no one behind is a key principle of the Sustainable Development Agenda, and uh, certainly going forward after 2030, it will still be important to look at leaving no one behind. Especially if we look at digitalization, it comes with great opportunities, but it comes with risks as well. So the digital gap is, is a risk and we all need to make an effort so that we uh, enable uh, and work against the barriers for the, uh, and give access to everybody to the last mile. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Isabel. And over to Mr. Angelo, our one participant from the private sector, really important stakeholder in the entire post-2030 process. Um, and it's really good to hear of the digitalization tools as well as the science and innovation tools that we're looking to bring up. Um, and these are going to be absolutely crucial for ensuring that you know, we have a just and equitable transition. So over to you, Mr. Angelo, on your take from the private sector perspective on the post-2030 agenda. Thank you. Thank you. I think private sector plays a crucial role in terms of sustainable development for 2030 and beyond. And there are three, four uh, interesting areas. And the first I would say is the mobilization of finances. Private sector has been, through direct investment, venture capital, or loans, been funding development activities in infrastructure building, renewable energy, healthcare, and education. And, uh, it's very interesting, in India, the private sector has contributed to 59% of the green finance between the years 19 and 20. And also interesting to note that in uh, 2020, the growth has been 130%. The second area I would look at private sector contributing to this agenda is about uh, technology. Private sector has always been at the forefront of research to develop new products, new technology, new business solutions, and new business models. Partnering with governments and uh, NGOs, we are able to implement a lot of action on the ground. A case in point, the role private sector played in India in terms of developing vaccines, and saving millions of lives, not just in India, but across the developing world. 
And when I look at it, maybe artificial intelligence could be the next inflection point which can help uh, the developing nations leapfrog some of the historical gaps that we have and bridge them. As we speak, the doctors in All India Institute of Medical Sciences are using artificial intelligence to understand the gene mutation so they can treat patients with specific medications. And one of the largest sectors in India which employs half the population, agriculture, to my mind, can undergo a dramatic transformation with the help of AI. And so heartening to see that over 1,000 agri-tech startups are coming up in India, which possibly is going to transform this into a tech-enabled domain. And uh, the Reserve Bank of India was talking about uh, adopting unified payment interface for loans to farmers. The third area could be corporate social responsibility. I think we survive as enterprises with a business proposition to make profits. But I think equally we are accountable to the society and give back to the society. I think it enhances our corporate reputation and add to brand value. And let me explain our own case on this. Bisleri is one of the most trusted brands in India, market leaders in packaged water for over 55 years now. I'm privileged to say and proud to say that uh, we are a water positive company, that we actually replenish more water into the ground than what we extract. All our facilities, we convert more than 90% of the water that we process, minimizing wastage. There are Rainwater harvesting facilities are integrated in our factories, and we restore water bodies in the vicinity. Our commitment extends to rural areas where we have built over 250 check dams, conserving runoff rainwater, and harvested almost 25 billion liters of water, helping about 53,000 farmers to create multiple crops, enhancing their livelihood. And the latest is restoring a lake in Leh, in Kashmir, at an altitude of 11,500 feet and yielding about 24.3 million liters of water, helping people in the entire landscape. The last one I would say is about job creation and capability building. I think private sector stimulates economic growth, creating job opportunities, and fostering inclusive development. I mean, we work with a lot of small and medium enterprises and invest in sectors with high growth potential, because that's important to ensure sustainability in employment. And interestingly, a recent report by the National uh, Account Statistics indicate that the private sector's wage bill of rupees 30 billion, 30 trillion, I'm sorry, has exceeded the government's wage bill of 28 trillion Indian rupees for the first time. And the upward trend seems to be more structural because it has moved up from 9% to 13% over the last decade. I think private sector has an important role to play and we will continue to play that role. Absolutely, Thanks. thank you. And that's a really crucial point which takes us to um, the next 15 minutes before uh, opening up for Q&A. So in the last 15 minutes, um, it'd be good for us to focus on what some of the processes and mechanisms are for us to get to. We've talked a lot about the, the financing gap. We've got trillions of dollars in financing. Um, we've got lots of initiatives for uh, green and circular economic growth um, to, to tackle in order for us to achieve these development goals. So, Mr. Minister Saud, um, from your perspective, can you tell us a little bit more about your take on the processes and mechanisms that you see that are going to be crucial for us to achieve the creation of additional resources for development needs in the region? Thank you. It is very big challenge for the countries to maintain this financial gap. 
uh, because uh, the world is almost in crisis. Uh, the economies of those countries which are said to be developed, they are also in slow growth rate. And those countries whose, which the countries are said to be in good condition, they are very limited. And uh, we, the remaining countries, are in challenge. So to maintain this deficit, uh, we should work together. Uh, as SDG goal already had uh, said that no, so nobody should be, uh, no, so no, nobody should be uh, in behind. So we should uh, cooperate each other as uh, government sector, private sector. We should work together, together and uh, the developed countries, uh, those institutions which are funding, giving finance, uh, giving debt to the developing countries, uh, they should interchange uh, those loans and grants and they also should, uh, uh, they should uh, exchange, swap also, swaps also. So, uh, in climate changes and other sectors uh, also, we should work together. It will, uh, it will easy, it will better to obtain, uh, fill the gaps, financial gaps. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. And um, of course, in Bhutan, you are known and you're in a very, very enviable position, Minister Dongyal, of having net negative emissions in Bhutan. Um, and I think it'd be very beneficial for everybody in the room and listening in online to hear more about Bhutan's um, processes and mechanisms that have been set up to continue to maintain neg net negative emissions and also to improve for example, initiatives like energy efficiency in your country. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, I think Bhutan by now is known to the outside world as carbon negative, not only, not only carbon negative, but it, it is a total carbon sink, I should say. Uh, the constitution of our country mandates that at all times to come, we need to have minimum 60% of land coverage under forest. Today, where we stand is we are safely above 70%. Having said that, there are challenges, obviously. Bhutan is trying to cope up with, with modern development, industrialization, people have to be taken care, as well as, as mandated in the Constitution, we need to maintain our forest cover. Now, when we talk about net negative or, say, a carbon sink, uh, easier said than done, maintenance is really, really challenging. Now, how we do it, what we are doing in the country is, uh, more than 99.97% of electricity that is supplied to the country is hydroelectricity that has zero emission, I believe. And uh, in the country, all the households are connected by uh, hydroelectric uh, supply, and uh, this was done since 2013 only. Uh, in this, uh, not only hydroelectricity, we need to further maybe work on alternatives uh, energy supply as well. Therefore, Royal Government of Bhutan is very seriously working on uh, uh, solar energy, wind energy, which are, of course, uh, non-emission 
these are these are eco-friendly units and uh, on this we do have even private sector uh, 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 so support in it, participation in it, because we have our panelists from private sector as well. I need to touch on that. And uh, even on the bigger hydroelectric projects, we have private participation in that. In the construction phase, most of it is taken by the private sector only. And as we move forward in the initial stage, the private sector participation brings a pool of expertise to be used for other projects that can come in the future. Therefore, uh, carbon sink, carbon negative is a challenge to maintain in Bhutan, but as of now, we are doing it. Thanks to the donor agencies, the support from external agencies that we are getting, and through that support only, and through our own country's effort, we are able to maintain it at 70% plus. We hope we'll be able to maintain it in the times to come as well, and uh, not to really go down below what is mandated in our constitution as 60% forest coverage. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister. And that encapsulates uh, a lot of the discussions around nature-based solutions and carbon sinks that um, are really crucial to ensuring our decarbonization journey remains on track. But there are also another set of um, tools and innovations. And Ms. Tatiana, earlier you mentioned a lot about the knowledge and science um, innovations and the knowledge and science economy. And how do you also see the knowledge and science economy helping to support and to accelerate the green and circular economy from your perspective? Thank you. Uh, thank you. In the first round, I used the uh, word uh, solidarity, but uh, in this round, I, I will uh, use the word responsibility. I think that we need res uh, to be responsible in different fields. So one of is uh, um, trying to uh, transfer our approach to linear economy to circular economy. Uh, that's why we already in Serbia uh, announced the Center for Circular Economy, which works uh, uh, as a part of our Chamber of Commerce. And uh, we are really ready to learn about that more from countries which advance in that field, because I think that we do not have any more luxury to just to use it, uh, take it, make it, use it, and dispose it. Uh, we really need to uh, save our sources uh, because uh, we see how it uh, happens in different time of crisis uh, that uh, we are limited, for example, with energy sources. Then the, uh, what we also need to do is interconnectivity, uh, which helps each other in different times of crisis. But the main responsibility in modern times should be uh, to be responsible to peace and stability. Uh, in different regions of the world, and I think that uh, we all need to um, bring that to, to our policies. Thank you very much. And now over to Mr. Angelo, um, really thinking about continuing on the theme of the knowledge and innovation for a circular economy. That this is an area that the private sector solutions are really, really crucial in bringing forth progress. So. I invite you, Mr. Angelo, to talk a little bit about your take from the private sector perspective. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, in the context of 2030 and beyond, circular economy possibly will show the way. And let me take through some of these dimensions. The first really is resource efficiency. I think circular economy is centered around, the concept itself is centered around the principles of reuse, recycle, and repurpose. This is particularly relevant in the context of developing countries, which are historically more resource constrained. And uh, industry can champion this narrative. Uh, let me share our own example. Uh, we are at the forefront of this movement in India, and one of the first companies in India to be plastic neutral recycling more plastic than what we put into the market. 
The primary challenge in India for plastic recycling is about irresponsible disposal and sorting of mixed waste. I think uh, we have a program called Bottles for Change, which is about educating public about the right ways of disposing post-use plastic and creating connects to the recyclers directly to the people. This program is now active in India, over 20 cities, and we have reached out to almost 800,000 people. We have initiatives that reduce packaging in terms of the quantum that we use, uh, and we work with partners to repurpose post-use plastic into materials. In fact, uh, our bislary uniforms are made out of PET bottles. When we look at from the context of India, I think it's very interesting. Prime Minister Suryoda Yojana, which is talking about creating 500 gigawatts of non-fossil energy. I mean, that's extremely interesting, particularly in the context of uh, electrical mobility as one of the future pathways for India in terms of reducing our dependence on fossil energy. The second area where private sector or industry could play a key role is about the green jobs. One can see that there is uh, immense scope for green jobs and entrepreneurship, both in areas of renewable energy, eco-friendly manufacturing, and even in circular design. We do our bit as well, encouraging the spirit of enterprise and innovation. We work with uh, Terry University, one of the universities based out of Delhi, to support rural entrepreneurs build practical business models to convert trash into treasure in their villages. And uh, the third area could be about supply chain resilience, I think, uh, uh, especially in the context of developing nations. It's important to build these circularity principles, which are actually centered around diversifying your raw material sourcing and as much as possible localizing consumption and production. I mean, in the context of uh, uh, India, for example, we have been able to manage a lot of this, that during the COVID period, our balance of trade has actually become positive. So in the calamity, there was a learning for the country in that sense. Uh, while there are still areas in India in terms of crude, some edible oils, specific pulses, semiconductors, we still need imports coming in largely, but those are areas which we can collaborate and figure out. Things are, however, improving because South-South trade in uh, 21 has actually become 5.3 trillion US dollars, which is more than the South-North trade. So the South-South countries are collaborating possibly better to make more resilient and uh, supply chain which are less vulnerable. The fourth point is about education and awareness. I think uh, promoting awareness about circular economy is crucial. That is what will bring behavioral change. We have seen that in the Indian context with uh, Swachh Bharat mission, building almost 100 million toilets in the rural areas in seven years. And I think uh, Education has helped communities make informed choices and make, improve their lifestyle. My personal belief is that circularity education should start young. And uh, we are, in fact, working with the Center for Environment Education. And we have created an illustrative guide for students towards responsible use of plastic that's going to be released in just about one week time from now. Interestingly, Bisleri has just set the new Guinness World Record for collection of plastic bottles, the maximum number of plastic bottles collected in 12 hours by collecting 79.4 tons of plastic just on 6th of this month. I think uh, industry is capable of creating credible frameworks and provide tangible examples to inspire meaningful response by the community. Thank you. The last point I would like to make is about policy. I think uh, it's important for circularity to be integrated with policy. And the prime minister of this country has launched the lifestyle for environment mission 
to motivate people, individuals and community for actions that will preserve the environment. And these rewards for these actions are to be treated like carbon credits. The frameworks are just being developed. Interestingly, last year in Racina Dialogue here, I was speaking about why carbon water credits as a concept should be coming in so that it will alert people and motivate people about conserving water in a country like India, which has 16% of the world's population, but only 4% of the groundwater. And I'm very happy that uh, water credit is featuring as one of the seven categories listed in the Lifestyle for Environment uh, launched by the Prime Minister. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Angelo and Ms. Ant Ms. Isabel. Um, it would be really good to hear from you also. We've, we've heard a lot uh, about how the private sector supports some of these initiatives. From your perspective, um, what are some of the broader uh, mechanisms, especially on the policy as well as the financing front, uh, that are needed to not just support industry but support the communities that are most vulnerable to climate um, change? Thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline. I just want to build on where um, Angelo stopped first on the partnerships and the mechanisms before we go into circular economy. Um, specifically for SDGs, I think one of the, for the acceleration and then also for the post-2030 agenda, clearly maybe one lesson learned since 2015 that maybe we have not worked so much yet with the private sector. The focus was very much on government, on the public sector, and this is what the UN and UNDP specifically uh, tries to facilitate. How can we facilitate the integration for, uh, of the private sector in, in, um, in, in their support also to achieve the, the SDGs? Here, I would like to give a very specific example, uh, and this comes from India, from the state of Karnataka. In India, uh, India has really embraced this SDG framework and has a, a framework on localization of SDGs, obviously, in, in such a big country. I think that is very much needed. And uh, several states have uh, so-called SDG coordination centers in their planning, in their planning commissions. And our role as UNDP is supporting the data collection and uh, help, uh, that there, um, help the state that there is data-driven policy making, but also the facilitation and the matchmaking between the investments and the areas which are lagging behind for the SDGs and the private sector. And we have helped to establish the so-called Akansha platform where in Indian, Indian companies can invest uh, their CSR funds, and you might know that India is the only country um, in the world which has a, a specific regulation on CSR, 2%, the 2% regulation that the corporate social responsibility funds uh, need, uh, need to be invested. And so we are helping this investment of CSR funds in specific areas of SDGs. That is just one example. Now, coming to um, circular economy, I think all, also there, it's very important that we have this public-private partnership. Um, and in addition to this partnership, uh, that we are looking at the social inclusion aspect. And I would like to give an example there. UNDP is partnering with Hindustan Unilever on uh, uh, an initiative on circular economy, on plastic uh, waste management. Uh, so one is obviously the, the waste management, but the other is uh, the dignity and the rights of those who are collecting the waste. Um, and in India, they're called the Safai Satis, so the waste pickers. So how can we combine initiatives which look at this circular economy and plastic waste management in this case, but uh, also uh, to help the the most vulnerable, those who are at risk of being left behind uh, to be included in all the social protection schemes which ex exist in this country. So that is one example. But another one, uh, I think we need to look at uh, this crisis of, the, of nature and biodiversity loss, climate change and pollution in an inter intersectional manner. This includes also the work, obviously, um, in, well, to, become, to become carbon neutral, the just transition approach. 
Again, there, um, one is obviously how quickly we can, um, we can implement this just transition approach, but also what, what, what will it mean for the people? What will it mean for the livelihoods of the people if we change, if we go in this transition? And again, there, UNDP, not only in India, but in other, in other countries globally, but also in the region, Indonesia and Vietnam, uh, we are helping to support, to develop these long-term policy frameworks to have a just transition, which uh, will help at the same time to continue to build the livelihoods uh, for, the, for the people. Thank you very much. A really good point on the just transition. We've heard about you know, a lot of these uh, processes around um, building the, the decarbonization as well as the post-2030 development pro pro progress. I think we have time to take one question. I'd like to invite the Rizina fellows in that corner of the room, please. Um, if one of you will come up and introduce yourself very quickly and take the mic. Um, and then we'll see if we can figure out time for additional questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the inspirational talk. I'm Yuka from Japanese startup that called PeoplePort. We are creating refugees employment in Japan. And there are two questions I would like to ask. And then first one is going to be Minister of Nepal and Bhutan. So could you ask, uh, could you give us the specific example for South-South cooperation to achieve SDGs if possible? And then second question is going to be Ms. Isabel. So uh, what is the most important key factor to uh, expand the South-South cooperation. Thank you. Maybe um, Minister Sao first and then Minister Nunya. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, uh, for SDP goals and uh, for uh, to maintain the deficit of development and finance also, uh, we, have, we should have to uh, work together with North, South, and South, South, because uh, North is also in constraint. Uh, they uh, mark, uh, um, uh, they achieve uh, development, their development in the cost of uh, environment and other things, and now the economy of the developed country is also in trouble, problem. So they are no, not on the stage that they can provide a large uh, community of the world uh, with resources. So uh, in this point, we should work together. The South-South work together. Uh, we should uh, produce, um, uh, we, we should use our resources, we, to, we should exchange our resources, and we should work together to go ahead. Uh, so, uh, North-South and South-South cooperation uh, is very important to uh, achieve the SDG goals and uh, post-SDG uh, deficit to remove post-SDG deficit also. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Minister Dungyal, please. <clears throat> Thank you. Well, my take on this is while South-South cooperation is important. North-South cooperation is inevitable. Likewise, cooperation among and between the communities, countries, be it South, be it North, be it West or be it, be it uh, East, cooperation is a must. Now, why I said South-South cooperation, why I focused on my first one about South-South cooperation is South-South cooperation means countries within the South-South region having similar geopolitical condition, having similar economic condition in a way, and having almost similar technological competence as well. Therefore, 
to have cooperation within South South is important, while it is also very vital to have North South cooperation. It doesn't mean that you know South South cooperation is aloof, separate, and North South is separate. No, it's not like that. As for my understanding, it has to be South South cooperation for its own advantage that has to be taken care along with cooperation among and between different regions. This might take on it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister. And over to you, Isabel, to take us home. Thank you. So what, what are the key factors? Well, I would like just to build on what uh, His Excellency just said. I think there is South-South, North-South, but also South-North. Um, uh, and um, so the, the most important for, for this, in my view, is the learning. Um, we are testing something in one country, and how can we then apply it uh, in another country? But for everything which we are testing new approaches, we always have lessons learned as well. It's not from the very beginning that things maybe work uh, as we would like to, and it is important to codify these experiences and, and then to share this learning. Um, and what is also important is to understand if we uh, export a solution from one country to another, what, are, what is the context in another country? Um, so I think uh, India has made excellent uh, progress, and in, if we look at uh, the whole digitalization, the whole digital digitalization of the vaccine, the administration of the vaccines in India, of the cold chain, but also the UPI, um, um, in, in India. These are excellent uh, tools and I think accelerators for the Sustainable Development Goals. And uh, India has made a lot of effort and uh, we are a proud partner as UNDP in also uh, making that uh, available for, for other countries. But I think it is important for it to be successful that we look at the frameworks in the countries where we want to export these solutions which means obviously the legislative framework, but also the capacity, the energy uh, sources available. So I think that is a very important factor for the success uh, of South-South, uh, North-South, or also South-North uh, cooperation. And I just heard yesterday, I think France uh, is very interested in adopting uh, the UPI uh, system of, of India. But again, I think uh, we need to look at the very context uh, to, to, make, to make it successful and that it has an impact for everyone. Thank, Thank you. you very much. And ho I hope, Yuga, that answers your question. Uh, we've and, and with that, thank you very much to this esteemed panel for bringing together not just the policy solutions, but also private sector as well as international organization perspectives on just collaboration all around and how, um, as the southern, uh, the global south leapfrogs some of these global challenges that ex exchanges of solutions can be brought forth, not just from the south-south or north-south context, but also from south-north as well. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much. Can I request you all please join me in applauding?